everyone. It's Professor Bryant, and I'm here to answer your questions. My 2018 spring semester management 1100 class at Atlanta Technical College has questions. So I am spending this time, I'm investing this time to answer those questions. I asked you to share the questions that you have concerning business and management and uh, managing people and processes and resources and life and career. And I compiled that list of questions throughout the weeks. And as promised, here is the first video of several where I will address each question as best as I possibly can while also providing you outside resources to further elaborate, as I don't have the time constraints, um, or I should say, as I do have time constraints to consider, right? I can't just create uh, hours and hours of content because you won't watch it. <laughs> we have to just be real about it. You won't watch it. So I'm going to also make sure that the, these slides are provided as a PDF for my students so that you can review and have direct access to the links at your leisure. So one of the, here are four of the questions. There were 27 questions that were posed to me and here are four that I'm going to answer today. The first is why is Peter Drucker considered the creator of modern management? What does management have to do with science? How did we get to today's forms of management? So it's basically looking at the evolution of management to now. And why is the classical view so important? So my first answer, we're going to look at Dr. Drucker, Peter Ferdinand Drucker. In 1932, he received his PhD in international law from Frankfurt University a few years later he realized while he was taking an economics class from the leading economist John Maynard Keynes that economists were interested in the behavior of commodities while Drucker was more interested in the behavior of people so he eventually taught some economics classes in the United States because he moved to the US in 1937 but after being exposed to the legendary chairman of General Motors in 1946, Drucker decided that he was going to transition but also expand his teaching to include philosophy and politics at Bennington College. Now, by 1950, Dr. Drucker joined NYU as a professor in management. He also began a formal consulting practice where he had his clients, which included IBM, Sears, and numerous others. In 1954, he published his first book, The Practice of Management, which is considered the first book to organize the art and science of running an organization. And the information that he shared in the book provided an integrated platform of knowledge for business leaders and academics. You can see this quote from Dr. Drucker where he says, performing responsible management is the alternative to tyranny and our only protection against it. Such an amazing mind. Dr. Drucker's book was the first book to bring together all of the pieces of business from finance to HR and his previous, the previous books that you found in business were only focused on the individual pieces of the pizza, right? That's how I would look at it. Drucker put all of the pieces together to show you what the entire pizza looks like. He's quoted as saying that it's like talking about anatomy but you're only talking about the elbow, but not the arm or the rest of the skeleton that the elbow is connected to. You must speak of the entire body and you can zoom in on the individual pieces that make up the body. Now that's my 
interpretation. That's my translation of his quote. So it's not a direct quote, but that's the gist of his quote. You can see the quote that I have on the screen where he says, I'm more interested in people than I am in how businesses work. This is a different mindset that Peter Drucker presented. In 1973, Drucker released his book, Management, Task, Responsibilities, Practices. And this became the playbook for generations of executives, business owners, managers, and government leaders. Many people see this book the same way that doctors see the physician's desk reference. His book was and has been the go-to reference book for managers worldwide. I love this quote from Dr. Drucker where he says, entrepreneurship is neither a science nor an art. It is a practice. It is a practice. Dr. Drucker was published has published, and he's contributed so much knowledge and wisdom, making positive deposits into the world. That's how I, I look at him. Um, you can read of his awards and accomplishments by searching through the Drucker Institute's website. Here's another quote that I love. The most important thing in communication is hearing what isn't said. That's deep. What is not being conveyed is what you should be focusing on. His brain was so fascinating. Dr. Drucker was still teaching at the age of 93, and that was in 2002. That spring, he taught his last course. But for several years after, he was still lecturing on and off. Yes. For several years, he was still lecturing on and off. He literally is one, is the, is the person, he's the sole person who established the study of management as a discipline. In 2005, he passed away at the age of 95, just a few days before his 96th birthday. Dr. Drucker's legacy will live on forever. Here is this amazing quote about marketing that I wanted to share. He said, the aim of marketing is to know and understand the customer so well, the product or service fits him and sells itself. That is so powerful. That is the reality of marketing. Um, and it's one of the reasons why when I got my MBA, my focus was on marketing. I The emphasis, I, I spent extra time in school on marketing. Um, you know, Dr. Drucker is one major reason that I am um, in the field that I am in, that I am an educator um, of college students, that I love marketing, that I love business, that I love management, that I love the, the science and dynamics that make up organizations and management. And, um, so I love that this question was posed to me. So I, did I answer your question to your satisfaction to that student who um, posed this to me? To learn more about Dr. Drucker, please visit the Drucker Institute. And here is the link that I've shared. Now moving right along, next question. What does management have to do with science? That's a very good question. Here's my answer. In 1911, the turn of the century industrial engineer, Frederick Winslow Taylor published his magnum opus, which is the principles of scientific management. And this book laid out his ground rules for efficient industrial organizations. His book is now a classic of managerial literature. His ideas have helped to shape companies around and across the industrial spectrum and define the task of management for generations of managers. He applied engineering principles to the work done on the, man, on the factory floor and 
it was instrumental in the creation and development of the branch of engineering that is now known as industrial engineering. He was the person who introduced the idea of time and motion studies. He was the first of management consultants. I mean, <laughs> because of Frederick Winslow Taylor, I am a management consultant and I teach management. He literally helped to launch this practice that I so proudly embrace. So, he's the father of management science. <laughs> Henry Ford, the founder and CEO of Ford Motor Company, was so intrigued by Taylor that he requested his assistance with operations at Ford. I've shared a link to a seven minute video that captures and highlights how Taylor helped to improve production at Ford Motor Company. You have to watch this video. It's very, very compelling and you get to really see um, the processes in which automobile production was literally transformed, not just at Ford Motor Company, but through automobile production companies all over because of Taylor. Now, here are two other giants that you cannot leave out when you talk about um, management science. Frank and Lillian, Lillian Gilbreth. Now they followed the pioneering work in time and motion studies that Frederick Taylor initially started. And on, they also developed the study of workplace psychology. So they combined two main streams of management thinking. And Frank, he had already been, he was already active in, um, this field about 36 years before he met and married um, Lillian. He used to be a bricklayer and he closely observed the ways the different men performed the task and he came to the conclusion that about some more efficient ways. In one case that he followed, um, he increased the rate of laying bricks from a thousand a day to 2,700 a day. That's, a, that's an extra 1,700 bricks that are laid a day based on his efficiency model. And then, oh my goodness, the first lady of management, Lillian Gilbreth. She wrote a thesis on the psychology of management and her first notable publication um, that was written was called Psychology in the Workplace. She was also the first female member of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. This power couple made short films to watch the industrial processes and office tasks that are performed to find more efficient ways. And they tested some of their ideas on their 12 children. Yes, 12 children. I've shared right here a link to a YouTube video of one of their original films. Please watch it so you can see how they study processes and tasks for efficiency and effectiveness. Another link that you see on the screen is um, an article by Slate, and it is highlighting and celebrating um, the woman who invented the kitchen, even though she never cooked and was known to not be a cook or a good cook at all. I mean, Lillian was a mechanical engineer, not a domestic engineer. However, she saw household labor as labor still. To her, it was labor. And because of that mindset, she, she developed efficiencies that were tied to household work. This genius, <laughs> helped to lay the groundwork and shaped how we run our households, how we cook and clean in our kitchens to this day. You have to click on that link. Um, of course, the other videos and other research that you'll find online covers this, but it was just a really great salute 
to this genius woman. The Bilbris are not as widely recognized for their time motion studies anymore because Taylor's reputation has overshadowed their work. But the, their other work with auto, um, automation and efficiency methods will forever be attributed to this power couple. What is so amazing is that um, you can see from the previous slide that I shared that Frank passed away in 1924. Lillian did not pass away till 72. So Lillian had to create and build her own um, body of work separate from Frank when he passed away. And so a lot of the um, information that you see on her has been since that time, after 1924. It's just amazing. Um, but what is really interesting is that some of you, when you do your research, I'm not going to say what movie it is, but you can see that two of their children um, wrote a book that was then transformed into a movie um, that was somewhat shaped on them, but not really. But um, I have se I've seen the movie, and some of you may have seen it um, if you're old enough to have seen it. But I'm not going to um, tell you. Let's just see if you take the time to find out. Um, I'm going to wrap this part up just to say this, that you can't discuss scientific management without talking about the Gilberts. They're just two powerhouses that have just done an amazing um, job and, and, and left an amazing imprint. So there are four steps that Frederick Taylor and the Gilberts utilize to make up what we call scientific management to this day. This is something that I also shared in our Chapter 2 lecture video, if you're in my class, if you recall. And that's evaluating the task by scientifically studying each part of the task, carefully selecting workers with the right abilities for the task, giving them the training and incentives to do the task with the proper work methods, and then using scientific principles to plan the work methods and ease the way for workers to do their jobs. In business, we use a great number of scientific approaches to managing people, processes, and resources. The earliest studies of business and management have all been led with scientific approaches. Problem solving and decision making have scientific approaches interwoven into how we examine, address, and solve problems and the steps that we take to make decisions. Many see management as a combination of science and art, where science is the knowledge and art is the application of the skills we possess and the knowledge we acquire. Some argue that uh, the more science and technology reshape the very essence of business, the less useful the concept of management itself as a science seems to be. Others would argue that management may indeed be a science, but not the science that most managers think. Since many managers are confusing the traditional view of science that was focused on analysis, prediction, and control, which contradicts and conflicts with the new wave of science that's embracing the complexities and chaos of all organizations and structures, both human and non-human. Today, scientists are focused on defining complex systems. Well, isn't that exactly what business is? A constantly changing, very complex system. So, did I answer your question fully and satisfactorily? <laughs> did I accomplish the task? I hope so. Here are some links to more sources on scientific management, the amazing Frederick Winslow Taylor, and the powerhouse couple, Franklin and Lillian Gilbert. Please use these links to further your understanding and exploration of this um, classic scientific approach to business and management. Next question. How did we get to today's forms of management? How did we evolve to what we're currently using today? Here's my answer. 
this link right here provides you with a very informative video that's provided by McGraw Hill, which is also the publisher of the textbook that we use in my Management 1100 class. This video is called The Evolution of Management. It's only 10 minutes, and I strongly recommend that you watch it. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's dated. It's from the 1990s. You're going to laugh, but guess what? It's still well produced and it reinforces what I shared in my chapter two video lecture if you're in my class. Watch this video. Final question. Why is the classical viewpoint so important? Well, um, the video link provided in the slide before this last one that I just showed, that answers the question as well as this entire video. But I'm gonna go ahead and break it down for you <laughs> so I can really marinate it in because this is one of the four questions. The classical viewpoint entered the mainstream in the early 1900s that placed an emphasis on increasing worker productivity. It was developed by Frederick Taylor Right? The classical theory of management advocates a scientific study of tasks and the workers responsible for them. The first of the historical perspectives is the classical viewpoint. It emphasized finding ways to manage work more efficiently. There were two branches. The scientific management um, emphasized the scientific study of work methods to improve productivity by individual workers. And Taylor offered four principles of science that could be applied to management. Then Frank and Lillian Gilbreth stepped in and they refined motion studies that broke job tasks into physical motions. Then we have the second perspective, which is the administrative management. And that was um, concerned with managing the total organization. Amongst his pioneers were Henry Fail, who identified the major functions of management, planning, organizing, leading, and control. That's something that we talk about in management. That's something that is utilized in management, and every good manager applies those four functions throughout their career. And then, of course, we have the legendary Max Weber. Um, who identified five positive bureaucratic features in a well-performing organization. The classical viewpoint showed that work activity was amenable to a rational approach, but it has also been criticized as being too mechanistic, um, as viewing humans as cogs in a machine, that there is a, a... And the goal is that... Um, workers would be provided with the necessary tools to allow them to maximize their efficiency and output. But people have criticized it for creating an assembly line atmosphere where employees only do menial jobs. Although many have shunned this viewpoint, it can be applied to companies that have repetitive tasks, such as factories. There are four main principles of the classical viewpoint which these are the basis of scientific management. The first is the company leadership should develop a standard method for doing each job using scientific management. Workers should be selected for a job based on their skills and abilities. Work should be planned to eliminate interruptions and wage incentives should be offered to encourage increased output. So, did I answer your question fully? and to your satisfaction. Well, if you need more information on the classical viewpoint, here's a great link that um, was provided by Villanova University that I found online that I think would also benefit you. So, it's a wrap. These are the end of the questions for video one. As I stated in the beginning, there will be other videos that I'm going to create to answer your questions as fully and precisely as possible. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for your questions. It is an absolute honor and privilege to 
um, provide these answers. Have a wonderful day.